Hi, and welcome to another episode of Verified, where we discuss contemporary topics in light of the Bible see, to see what it has to say. And this week, I'm joined by four of our amazing students uh, here from Oakwood University. And I just want to do a brief introduction by asking your name and in what ways have you served on campus or are you serving on campus currently? I am Keelan Crum, and I currently serve as the Religious Vice President for our United Student Movement. All right. Hi, my name is Jill Scott, and I am president of the WAVE Club, which stands for Women with Ambition, Virtue, and Excellence, as well as the UNICEF Club, which stands for United Nations International Children's Emergency Fund. All right, thank you, Jill. Hello, my name is Donovan Williams. I have the privilege of serving as the current United Student Movement president. I've also had the opportunity to serve as the financial vice president and representative of the finance part department of the School of Business as well in the Senate. All right. Uh, my name is Natalie and Natalie Francois, and I am the chapel director for this school year. A shameless plug, uh, tune in on Thursdays at 10 a.m. Central Time to join us and join us online uh, where you will be able to watch chapel with the Oakwood University uh, family. Amen, amen. And you guys have all been doing such a great job. So I appreciate you guys, and you've been serving in ministry, so... Hey, that's all a chaplain could ask for, <laughs> all right? All right, well, let's dive right into this week's lesson. Um, we've heard about the golden rule before Jesus. In this chapter, we, we learn a lot about the life of Jesus and some of the things that he talked about, right? So you've heard the golden rule before, right? Yes? Yes. Sure. Yes. You know what yes. the golden rule is? Somebody yeah. tell me, what's the golden rule? Treat people in lay terms. <laughs> treat people the way you want to be treated. Yes, yes, yes. So it's important. Again, we're picking up on this theme. We can't just talk about being Christians. We can't just mm -hmm. think that we're all right because we go to church on the correct day. Mm -hmm. It's also important how we treat people. So we're going to talk about that. And we're going to start at the very beginning, the birth of Jesus. I mean, I don't know if you guys have ever thought about who... Who received this announcement and, and the, the humble beginnings of Jesus? I don't know if you ever thought about that before. Did, did anything jump out at you at this lesson? So something I loved about this lesson was actually following the life of Jesus mm -hmm. and looking at the way it was back then and looking at it now, you really see how much Christianity, Christianity has changed. So if you look at Luke 18, verse 1 to 8, that whole text is great and all, but the last one, verse 8, it asks the question, how many will have faith when Jesus returns? Mm -hmm. And honestly, if you asked that question back then, I mean, everybody would have. But as I feel as though, as the times have changed and where we are now, Christianity has changed so much where we think of God differently and we think of his power and his mercy and his might and mm -hmm. everything um, as different. And as I looked at the lowly birth of Jesus and watched as he basically moved his way up and as he grew up and how people reacted to him at many stages of his life and how it is now, it's totally different. And mm -hmm. I think that as Christians and as, not even, not even Christians, as people who want to change, mm -hmm. I think it's important to look back at that and really understand who God is because I think we know but we don't necessarily understand. And that's something that just, I don't know, it kind of shocked me because when I think about how many will have faith when Jesus returns, I just, I think it's very different than yeah. the way it was before. Yeah. Well, I'm going to push back a little bit. Not because I disagree. I agree. <laughs> I do agree. But I think what we're seeing now, what, that, that question that you said he was asking, how many will have faith? I would say that not a lot of people had faith when he was here. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because when, when we actually think about it, even with his birth and his first couple of years, I mean, look at how the king responded when they came to him and said, a king has been born. They're like, really? Where? Where is he? So I can kill him, basically. Mm -hmm. You know, and then when we think about the ministry of Jesus and how people responded to his ministry, I mean... They were cool with the miracles. It's just mm -hmm. once he started talking, they were like, yeah, we don't want to hear anything mm -hmm. you have to say. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. I don't think there was a lot of... People believed in what he was doing, but they didn't like the way he was going about doing things. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Or what he was saying. And so because of that, they were just like, yeah, we're going to crucify you, mm -hmm. Jesus. You know? And I 
So I say that because I think, well, I guess I would ask the question to you all, are we going back to that? You know, and I mm-hmm. think that's what the lesson is trying to point out. Like, what kind of things would Jesus be say- saying today about how we treat one another? Um, do we practice sympathy, empathy towards one another? Let's break that down, actually, real quick. <laughs> what, how, do, how would you define sympathy? How would you define empathy? Okay, so I looked it up because I thought I knew. And I did, but they were actually switched. So sympathy is when you share the feelings um, with somebody else, like you actually know how it feels. Mm -hmm. And empathy is where you understand the feelings, but you can't necessarily share in that emotion with them. Mm -hmm. So I actually thought it was the other way around, but I'm glad I looked it up just so I came here with some knowledge. Yeah, I got you. (laughs) Appreciate that, Jill. Anybody else? Can you break that down? Okay, so let's say... We have mothers, Mm -hmm. and they both passed away. Mm -hmm. I sympathize with you because I lost my mother as well. Mm -hmm. But let's say my mom is alive, however, you lost yours. Mm -hmm. I empathize because, ooh, if I lost mine, I'd be a wreck and you're a wreck. So I get it, but I don't because I haven't, like, I still have her at the end of the Mm -hmm. day. So that, that's the way I look at it. So I know exactly how you feel because we've been in that same situation. I share your feelings. Whereas I empathize with you as like, I hear you and I can understand it, but I can't equate anything in my life with that. So would you say that empathy is like getting down there with them, getting down in the trenches with them and things of that sort? Like, would you describe empathy as something like that? I would, okay. yes, because I'm, I'm sharing that feeling. Mm-hmm. And I feel your tears because mm-hmm. if I if that I would be a wreck too. So I share that, but I can't necessarily understand or know exactly. But I do share in that with you. Okay. Mm. Okay. Do you think we see a lot of sympathy and or empathy in our church? Honestly speaking, I feel like like you know when let's say for example, right? Let's say that a funeral takes place, and. <laughs> It's crazy. Let's say that a funeral takes place. Church people, they'll go there, you know, support the family and things of that sort in the beginning parts of, you know, when they find out that the person has passed away, their loved one has passed away. And then when, you know, the latter part after the burial burial is done and things of that sort, where's the church people? Mm. So it's like they think that, you know, after, you know, the funeral is done and everything, that that's when everything stops, like there's no more hurt, there's no more pain that's taking place. However, the most pain that takes place is after. Like Mm. there's nobody that's, you know, available after. So to answer the question, I would feel like, I would say that it's like an on and off thing. Church Mm. people, they would, you know, show sympathy and empathy sometimes, but not all the time. Like, you know, we have food drives. That's a way of showing, sympathy or empathy it can't i always mix those two up that's why i asked jill yeah. for yeah, clarification yeah. Yeah. so um because the food drive is also another example or another way of you know showing like hey okay we want to give back to the community um we may not have all the funds but you know we want to give back you know whether that's canned foods or you know vegetables or anything of that sort so i would say that it's like on and off with mm. uh, church people yeah yeah and just For people who may not know, and I know there's a conversation that's happened before, Uh, this is kind of a sidebar, but I think it's important to bring it up when we, especially since we're discussing sympathy and empathy. Mm -hmm. Um, a A lot of times nowadays, there'll be a conversation, well, why do we still have regional conferences? You know, um, Hmm. why not just bring all the conferences together? Hmm. It it comes up a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, And without answering that question specifically here, Part of the history as to why we felt the need for regional conferences is because at first um, we had congregations of color that were being pastored by Caucasian pastors. Mm -hmm. Not to say that they weren't good, but not to say that they didn't have any sympathy, but they definitely didn't have empathy Mm -hmm. because they could not relate to the black experience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so eventually it became, we saw a need for having more representation in leadership Mm. and it wasn't really happening. Um, And a lot of tragic things happened within our church, things that we're not proud of, which eventually led people of color to say, you know what, we need representation um, because we need leadership that is going to be empathetic. And so, yeah, that's part of the history for those who may not be aware. 
And I'm not going to get into some of the specifics, but just to give you an idea why there was a need. Now, the question, is there still a need, is what people debate nowadays. But we're not going to get into that today. <laughs> <laughs> that might be for another episode. But going back to Jesus now, a couple of things the lessons point out on, I want to look at Monday and Tuesday. And guys, you can jump in at sure. whatever, mm -hmm. whatever sure. point, all right? Mm -hmm. But Jesus did talk about the marginalized in society and how they should be treated we see him bringing the marginalized in, whereas it seemed the, the, the people of his day were pushing them out. What does that tell us about how we should treat some of the marginalized groups in our society? Like, what are some of the things that, the, let me just go to one of the questions that they pointed out. What are some attitudes and practices we should address in our church to help us readily welcome outcasts like bikers, addicts, homosexuals, or homeless persons. This comes from Tuesday's lesson. Mm -hmm. So what do you think? What are some of the attitudes that we should practice and practices that we should address in our church to invite these people groups in? Donovan? I, th I think, Chap, since we were talking about the golden rule earlier, that would be something that you could institute when you're talking about welcoming people into the church. Because if you're someone and this also ties into what we talked about last episode with church hurt. My definition of church hurt is when someone experiences the bounds or confines of a religion as opposed to the love and the good that people are supposed to do by following the doctrine that outlines what their religion is. And that isn't just Adventism, that's any, that's what's called church hurt. Because right. it's not just in the Adventist church, it's, you know, of course all denominations. Yes. Um, and so I think attitudes or practices that we can adopt as current members of uh, any given uh, congregation is understanding or, or trying trying to empathize as best as you can, right? Because you don't have the experience of a homosexual or a bike or an addict or anyone who's coming from an outside demographic. But if you could imagine that you were, how would you want to be treated you know, if you were coming from the outside, would you want someone to tell you that, you know, you're living a, a lifestyle that's not acceptable to Jesus and you've never had an experience with Jesus before? Mm -hmm. Do you think that that would be something effective in, you know, starting your relationship with Christ or with whomever, you know, whatever church you're getting into? Um, and so I think using the golden rule is, is an answer to me for how um, you can deal with people who are part of marginalized groups. Mm -hmm. I see a couple. Of, I mean, I've we, heard we a couple hear of voices you, coming so. out. <laughs> well, according to the two synoptic gospels, one including Luke and Mark, um, Jesus shows Take Theo Major. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> Jesus shows compassion um, towards certain group of people, uh -huh. and because of the compassion that he shows to these uh, group of people, people don't understand why he communicates with people the way he is. And in our modern church, many times we don't communicate well with a certain group of people mm -hmm. in our church. If you don't serve in the church, you're not nothing. If you're not an elder, you're not anything. If you're not a part of the bo church board, you're not anything. And here it is, according to, to Luke 5, Jesus demonstrated that all people are to hear the good news, no matter what you are, no matter what background you come from. And even in Sunday's lesson previously, it raised the question, it said, could any good thing come from a hood? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or as it used here, a ghetto. Mm -hmm. And to that extent, I would say yes, because we see Jesus and his character, where he was born, how he was raised up and able to form all sorts of miracles. And not only that, he loved everyone the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. that's a serious standard uh, measure right there. And when we measure against that context, we all fall short, right? Yeah. I mean, I can't think about loving everybody with the same amount of love, yeah. mm -hmm. unless he does it in me. Mm -hmm. Like, I just can't. There's certain people that are hard to love, mm -hmm. yeah. you know? That's real. I mean, it, yeah. If we're being honest, there's certain people that's hard to love. But still, he says, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Mm -hmm. And then he defines it in the context of love even your enemies. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a great point, Kilan. Um, and Jesus, he just showed that love all the time. You know? That's One of, true. Go ahead, Jill. I think he not only showed love, but the biggest thing is respect. Mm. And in that. terms of talking about marginalization, one of the biggest people or 
group uh, marginalized in the Bible uh, were women. Mm -hmm. And I mean, some were called names, not looked at, not talked to. You came in, you served your purpose, and then you're out. You don't leave your house without, um, you know, getting permission or being sent somewhere for something for your husband. Mm. Um, you're, you're under your father's care until you're moved on to be basically married off. And then even that, the father um, arranged with the new man. Mm -hmm. um, so connecting that, I think it's respect because there's even... Instances here in John and Matthew and Luke where it's like people, I think somebody said it, I don't remember who, but they were like, some people couldn't understand why Jesus interacted with people the way he did because mm -hmm. they wouldn't because they're like, she's a sinner. Why are you talking to her? She's this, why? Are you? And Jesus is like, but you know what? She treats me 10 times better than you have. I mean, I came into your house. You didn't offer me water or anything, but yet she's, you know, washing my feet with her own tears and her own hair mm -hmm. and using rare perfume that, you know, you could have sold somewhere else. But anyway, I think the biggest thing is respect. And there are times where Jesus looks at a person, at a woman, at a female, and he talks to her. And that may sound very... Like, that's not significant because we're in 2022 and I'm sitting looking at you. But right. back then, they didn't even do things like that. Mm -hmm. And I think so, I think oftentimes we get so caught up with ourselves and yeah. so caught up in what we're doing and the emotions that we're going through that we forget about everything else. And I mean, even last episode when we were talking about remembering the Sabbath day and keeping it holy, sometimes we don't even remember the Sabbath day. We know it's Saturday and we know it's Sabbath, but we don't, I don't, I don't think we really look back at that time and what Sabbath is made for and just all that stuff. Yeah. Um, and I think we lose sight of the core because mm. we're so caught up in basically things surrounding. So I would say outside of love, another big theme is respect and treating people like Donovan said, the way that you want to be treated mm. and remember that if you were at that point, um, how would you feel? And yeah. a lot of people, I would say we as Adventists, sometimes we're so up here that we forget we were once down here. Mm -hmm. And I mean, Jesus, he was a popular guy. You know, he had crowds. People are trying to touch him even on the leg just to get healed. Mm -hmm. But he also grew up poor. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he basic, he came from nothing. Mm -hmm. And even though he worked his way up that scale through hardship, nonetheless, he never lost sight of basically the people who, who are where he was. And I mm -hmm. think as we kind of get up there, we turn our noses and we shut people out because you're doing this and you're doing that, but yet you sin and no right. sin is greater than the other. Mm -hmm. And I think we lose sight of that sometimes. Yeah, and I mean, we were talking about sympathy and empathy before. Mm -hmm. Then you were just talking about what the lesson pointed out about how Jesus dealt with women. Mm -hmm. So how was he able to demonstrate empathy to a woman being a man you know what I'm saying and we don't necessarily have to answer it but the fact that he was able to do it means that we should be able to empathize even with those who we may not be able to we haven't walked in their shoes mm -hmm. but the Holy Spirit enables us to to be able to empathize and we should just stop and think because at the end of the day everybody's got a story right mm -hmm. yes you know people don't just <laughs> decide oh I want to do this like mm -hmm. one of the examples like you said the woman who was washing Jesus's feet mm -hmm. according to the scripture she was involved in a certain lifestyle mm -hmm. you know that's why they said if they knew who was touching his feet if he knew who was touching his feet he would not let her do that mm -hmm. but obviously not only did he allow her to do that but then we're talking about her today in 2022 mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because Jesus lifted her up rather than, you know, not giving her a voice. He, he empathized, right? Mm -hmm. So if we, if we would just remember that we're all human beings, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. We all have our stories. We all have our hurts. We all need and I Jesus. think, you know, yeah. I mean, I don't like suffering, but it does give me an opportunity to get a window into somebody else's mm -hmm. experience so we can mm -hmm. offer that, that, um, that empathy. Mm -hmm. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? I feel like we, we can do better when yes. it comes to that. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, that's one of the things I, I mentioned it briefly. Jesus's interaction with women. I mean, he did not treat the women of his day the way they were used to being treated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that says a lot because we see a lot of that happening today as well. It's one of the issues that we try to deal with in society. Mm -hmm. Right. Would you say that's another marginalized group within our church? 
Absolutely. Women? Absolutely. Yeah. Why do you say that? I would say so. Um, I remember we talked about groups that were marginalized outside of the church and then what groups may be specific to the church that are marginalized. But I think the mar marginalization of women penetrates even the church and, and along with it comes, you know, for, for women of color or black women um, specifically. Uh, and I think that's largely due to, to human nature and how people have observed and interpreted texts. I mean, you have texts in the Bible that say women shouldn't speak in church and they should dress a certain way and cover their heads. Um, and I also want to contrast that with how Jesus treated women in his time. That, it, it, to me, it's inconceivable how progressive he was because mm -hmm. people regularly just disrespected women and treated them as lesser than I mean, in the lesson, I think it says women were basically regarded as chattel slaves mm. um, in their mm -hmm. times. And so for Jesus to address them with such grace and, and respect and dignity, it's very progressive and shows how much love he had. And it really gives us a great example um, of what we should strive to do when it comes to dealing with people from all kinds of marginalized groups. But I, w I would certainly say women um, are, are a marginalized group, even within the church. Mm. Mm. Couple well, of ladies on the panel. I mean, yes. yeah. Well, I, you know, you want to go first? I, I, I can say something. <laughs> because even as me being, you know, a theology major, that's mm -hmm. a, I'm a woman, um, there has been a lot of pushback of, you know, whether I should go into p pastoring and things of that sort. And anytime that I would, you know, pretty much tell somebody, hey, I'm a theology major, it's like, what? you, you're a theology major, it's always some sort of pushback that takes place, you know, pretty much symbolizing or pretty much saying that women should or should, should not be in, well, women should not be in a position where men ought to be. Mm. So I came from a career, I'm Caribbean, and for those that are Caribbean, y'all know what I'm talking about. We see, we, we see men um, stepping in positions that, you know, anybody could step in. So it's like the, uh, the elders, they're men. Pastors, they're men. All we see are men in the, in the higher positions. So that's just a, a different perspective of how, you know, women in positions, higher positions, um, are not respected. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's sad. It's sad. It, it hurts as well to know that, you know, your people, church people, you know, don't really support you. Yeah, no. So. And hey, sis, keep following your call. <laughs> God, God will yes. work out. No, I'm serious. Um, and I want to wrap. I want to wrap uh, today's lesson up by looking at one of the questions um, from Friday, mm. because we want to talk about okay, how do we start to change things on a practical level? Um, and I'll look at question two and somebody just answer it for us. We only have time for, for one person. So if you feel impressed, just say something, all right? <laughs> so question number two says, which way of doing justice is more important? Helping the wounded to heal or working to prevent their being wounded by disarming the persons and systems responsible? So which one do you think was, is more important? And then which way do you think Jesus went about addressing it? I think it's 50-50. Okay. And I would say 50-50 because it's important to help the wounded to heal, but it's also important to work to prevent their being wounded. And mm -hmm. I think it's about mm -hmm. who you're helping. Mm -hmm. There's not one way to teach everybody. Mm -hmm. Everybody learns in different styles. Mm -hmm. Everybody has had different pathways and different lives. And because of that, I think it's very, it's situational based on who you're talking to, what they've been through, and how you're trying to help them. All right. Excellent answer. Thank you very much, Jill. And thank you to... Each of our panelists, uh, thank you to our viewers for joining us for another week. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again on next week. We pray that you've been blessed by this episode of Verified and that you've been enjoying the Social Justice in the Word complimentary lesson. We'll see you again next week right here from Oakwood University. God bless.